I want you to get your Bibles, and we're going to go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 16. The last, uh, last week we started uh, talking about the glory of the new covenant. We did part number one, and we talked about veils and the removal of veils and how that your Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, when he hung between heaven and earth and said, it is finished, the temple veil ripped into from the top to the bottom. But yet in 2 Corinthians chapter 3.16, Paul writes that when a person turns to the Lord Jesus, the veil is removed. So I thought, I thought the veil had already been ripped in two, but Paul reveals that there is another veil that remains. In verse 15, he described the veil that remains is the veil in our hearts. But he says that when we turn to the person of the Lord Jesus, that veil that prevents us from seeing clearly is removed the very moment that we turn to him. Now, that don't, turning to him don't mean one particular Sunday or Saturday or one day during the week that you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. But every single day we turn to him. Are you with me? Every single day we turn to him, we look at him, we behold his beauty and his glory. Now, we started talking about veils, and we did uh, a good job with that last week. And now we're going to look at the, at the next portion of that in this series, which is concerning gates. And the Bible is full of scriptures, hundreds of scriptures, hundreds of references concerning gates in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We're going to look at one of the applications of those gates this morning. And by the time we are finished today, you're going to understand, number one, you are a gate that God wants to come through. Oh, y'all should have shouted right there. Let's take two. You are a gate that God wants to come through and manifest himself through on this earth, just like it is in heaven. The enemy has gates as well, but we understand that the enemy's gates will not prevail. So let's go here in Matthew chapter number 16. Uh, and so we'll be talking about the glory of the new covenant Subtitle, we're going to look at gates. Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 16. I'll be reading from the New King James. When you find it, let's just stand for the reading of the word of the Lord in honor and reverence to the scriptures this morning. Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 16. It says, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Berjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, will not be able to prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Somebody ought to get excited right there. Now you got some keys. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word today. We just thank you for your presence. And I thank you for just resting in this place, resting. Find a place to rest in us today. We'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Now, this is a very familiar passage of scripture in Matthew chapter number 16. Jesus calls the disciples together and he asked them a very simple question. And his question was, is who do men, who do people, who does everybody else say that I am? Now, imagine if you've got together your closest friends and you ask them this question, who does everybody else say that I am? 
Now, if you were to ask, if, if, if you were to ask some of my friends, who is Michael Watkins? There would be some that would say, well, Michael Watkins uh, sells and buys plastics and distributes them around the world and he works with international businesses and he's the he does this and and lots of people would tell you what what I do you ask some of the people and some people would say oh well he is the senior pastor at Northwest Christian Fellowship but if you ask my wife she would say oh that's my husband the most brilliant man on this planet just full of <laughs> <laughs> Full of himself. No, I'm just. If you if you ask my son, who is he? He said, "Oh, that's my dad. That's my dad." You see, you see, everybody, everybody will talk about you in relation to the fellowship or the connection that they have to you. If you ask some people, they say, "Oh." Oh, Michael, oh, he is a son of the Most High God, you know. You know, some, you know, all people will answer according to their relationship with you. And so Peter stands up and says, okay, Jesus, people are saying that you are John the Baptist. People are saying that you are Elijah. Some people are saying that you are Jeremiah. Some people are saying that you're one of the prophets. There's four categories. There's four groups of people that they're saying that you are. But it's funny how what they were saying about him was really not who he was. And so if we ask, if we took a poll on your Facebook page and required all of your friends to answer this one question, who do you say that I am, every one of them would say something about you in light of the relationship that they have with you. Some of your old high school buddies, some of your old college buddies, they might have a different perspective about you than the church folk. Yeah, I want to talk about that, huh? See, everybody will talk about you in relationship to where they know you and how they know you. So why did Jesus ask this question? Who do men say that I am? Was he, was he, was he trying to get a, 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 a popularity index to see where he stood with people? Or was he leading the disciples into a line of thinking that would lead up to kingdom revelation and kingdom manifestation? I believe it's the latter. Because I've, I've learned something about walking with the Lord Jesus. He don't ask you a question that he don't already know the answer to. And so just because he's asking you a question is not because he's trying to figure out something new. He's leading you to a different line of thinking and a, and a line of thought that's in alignment with him. Well... The problem with John the Baptist is that John the Baptist had just been beheaded. So look at their theology. Okay, this is the reincarnation of John the Baptist. Isn't that a great thing? It's like, no, we don't even believe in reincarnation. What's, what's wrong with this line of thinking? This is Elijah. Well, he had died 600 years ago. This is Jeremiah. He had died 500 years ago. This is one of the prophets. They were already all dead. But Peter, when asked the specific question, who do you say that I am? He says something so awesome. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. They're connecting you with death, but I'm connecting you with life because you are the son of the living God. Because I have this fellowship with you, I see that you are not the God of the dead, but you are the God of the living and you are alive forevermore. Come on and give him some praise in this house. So, so, so he asks this question, and Peter responds, You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. 
So the first thing that we see in this, number one, is that when you tell Jesus who he is to you, he can then tell you who you are to him. See, that's, oh, this, this, that's worth the price of admission right there. Right there. When you tell Jesus who he is to you, he can then tell you who you are to him. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turns around and says, okay, you are Peter. And on this rock of revelation is what I am going to build my church. This is why worship, this is why praise, the vocalization of your worship to the lordship of Jesus is so vital. Somebody said, well, in my mind, I'm just saying over and over, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my King. And inside, I'm just so happy. Do you realize you can't even be saved? You can't even be born again until you confess something with your mouth. You confess. You don't think about the Lordship. You confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ. See, this is the glory of the new covenant. When we begin to confess to him what he is, Lord Jesus, you are wonderful. You are glorious. You are my healer. You are my provider. You're the captain of my salvation. You're the Lord of hosts. You're the prince of peace. You are the El Shaddai. You are the God that's more than enough. You understand when you begin to vocalize your adoration to him, he can start telling back to you you now what you are to him that's why the vocalization is so important see what you believe when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ he is the Messiah he is the son of the living God you have just established a foundation in which revelation from heaven can rest Revelation from heaven can rest on the foundation of your belief and confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and He is the Son of the living God. That establishes framework in which revelation from heaven can rest. How do I know that? Because after Peter said that, Jesus turns around and says, flesh and blood didn't tell you this, but this kind of revelation came from my Father, which is in heaven. You see, when we begin to confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you say, yeah, but I'm thinking about it. Well, you need to vocalize it. It's something that he said in, 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 in Isaiah. He says, let the weak just think, I am strong. Think, thong, think, think strong thoughts. No, he said, let the weak say, I am strong. He said, let the poor say, I am rich. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There's something that's got to come out of your mouth uh, that vocalizes uh, your dependence uh, and your belief uh, on the resurrected Jesus Christ. Come on and give him some praise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see, that, that, that confession, that belief lays the groundwork in which revelation from heaven can rest. How many would just love for some revelation from heaven to rest upon you? Look at how it begins. Look at how it begins. It begins with the believing in your heart and the confessing of the Lordship of Jesus Christ that He is the Son of God that lays the found work, foundation framework in which revelation from heaven can rest upon you. Which reminds me in the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter number 5, he saw in a vision, and he began to see these scrolls 
from heaven, coming from heaven to the earth, and these scrolls were looking for a place to rest. They were looking for a place to land, but they couldn't find a place. Do you want me to help you? To see how these scrolls or these revelation from heavens can land inside of your heart. We see that key right here. There are all kinds of scrolls. There are all kinds of, of revelations and insight and divine instructions that are released from heaven. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saying to the church today. So what, what we see is God... God hasn't stopped talking, we just stopped providing a landing strip for what he's saying to start landing in us. So Zechariah saw all of these scrolls flying around in the heavens, looking, and I just, I wish I tried to get a picture, but I, I couldn't find one that matched my imagination. But I just, so I'll just tell you my imagination. I saw these scrolls, these round scrolls with these eagle's wings just flying around through the air. Just flying through the air saying, oh, I'd like to land here. I'd like to land here. Looking for a place to land. Words from the Lord. Ideas. Inventions. All kinds of wisdom from heaven. Just looking for places to land. And I want to tell you, you can provide a place for those scrolls to land in the side, on the inside of your heart and in your mind when you just begin to vocalize and confess Jesus Christ, he is the son of God. He is my Lord. He is my king. Yeah, but pastor, 25 years ago, I prayed that prayer. Would it hurt to pray it every day? Jesus, I thank you that you are my Lord. I confess you are Lord. You are Savior. You are my Redeemer. Would, would, would it hurt anything? Y'all got to talk back to me. Matter of fact, it will probably help a whole lot when we begin to make those confessions. Why? Because your Bible says that you can't even declare that Jesus is Lord without the help of the Holy Ghost. So you want to get the Holy Ghost involved in your life? Just begin to start confessing in your home while you're driving down the road, while you're at work, while you're at, at places doing things. Just begin to vocalize, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Savior. And it won't be long until you'll start sensing and becoming more aware of the person of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who is empowering you to make that declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you want to start making some landing spaces in your heart, just vocalize Jesus, your Lord, Jesus, your Savior, Jesus, your Son of the living God. Watch this. I think this is so cool. Peter's confession lined up with his revelation. The question is, is how often does our confession line up with our revelation? He had a revelation that Jesus was the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. But his confession matched up with his revelation. Many people have a revelation. Now, now, this is what we talked about three weeks ago. Y'all remember what we talked about three weeks ago? You're like, Pastor, I don't know what you said five minutes ago. <laughs> three weeks ago, we talked about it's not good enough just to have correct theology it's, not, it's, it's good to have correct theology, but that's not good enough. You see, we have to have an experience of what we're believing. You can have correct theology that Jesus is your healer. But if you are not experiencing that, you can see where good theology is not enough. We need experience. Would you agree we need to experience some of the correct things that we're believing in the word of the Lord? You can have the correct theology that he is the provider. But if you are not experiencing the provision, 
Don't you understand? Don't you agree? We need to experience the correctness of what we're believing. That's why we said we cannot have correct theology is not enough. We have to experience. We can believe God's going to baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. But if we don't experience that, we believe God speaks to us through prophets, apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers, uh, through all of the saints. God is still speaking and revealing. But if we're not experiencing that. But Peter had a confession that lined up with the revelation. What would happen if all of our conversations started lining up? With the revelation that the Lord Jesus has already given to us. How many times has our confession been in direct conflict with what we know to be true through the word? Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Now, that's not what the word said. Now, that's not what the word said. And you know it don't say that. So why is your confession going against what you know to be true? Is that too much? Is that too much? <laughs> I want to bring it to you because we're going to have to correct what we're saying. We're going to have to correct what we're saying out of the abundance of your heart. Your mouth speaks. When I'm getting this word on the inside, at some point, my confession has got to line up with the revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Number two. I notice we're beating a dead horse right there, so we're going to the next part. That we'll, we'll, we'll leave that. We'll leave. We'll, we'll let that one take some root. I sow the seed. Somebody else will water it, but God will give the increase. Watch this. <laughs> Number two, we see from this passage that the Lord Jesus is the one who's building the church. Oh man, if we could just have a good worship team. Oh, man, if we could just have a good children's program. Oh, man, and, and I'm saying those things are good. Those things are awesome, and I want it all. But it's not things, it's not stuff that builds the church. It's the Lord Jesus who's building the church, and we get an opportunity to co-labor with him in the advancement of his kingdom on this earth. Who wants to be a part of what Jesus is building? I do. I do. I do. So we co-labor with him. He says, he says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Upon this revelation that Jesus is Lord. He is the son of the living God. On that revelation, I'm going to build. I'm going to build my church. Jesus is the one building the church. We get to co-labor with him. Psalms 127, verse number 1 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain. They that build, labor in vain. In other words, if we are not building what He is building, what we're doing in our efforts are pointless. I want to be building what He's building. I think one of the most frightening things in Scripture is is the revelation and understanding that we can be successful in an area that God has not called us to be successful in. Jesus was good. Example, Jesus was good at doing miracles, but that was not his purpose. His purpose was to lay down his life as a ransom for many. You may be good at business. You may be good at fill in the blank. But you have to ask, am what I doing, am what I am doing, am what I am doing. I just want to do this in tongues, y'all. Am what I am doing, is it in alignment with God's original plan and purpose, his design for my life? The most frightening passage in the, in the whole Bible, in my opinion, is, for, is when he looks at the people and the people said, Hey, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? Have we not done all of these great things? And he said, Man, you're getting the right results, but I didn't even know you. So see, it's, it's, it's very possible 
that we can be successful in something that he's not assigned us to without even knowing him. That's how much power is in his name. He said, I'm building the church. So let's do a quick lesson on the church. Who is the church? What is the church? The church, the, the, the original word, the Greek word is ekklesia, that is translated church. It, it, it's the called out ones. So we're called to stand out. But now think about this now. Centuries, centuries before the new covenant was ever written, the Greeks were using the word ekklesia, church, to describe a group of citizens that were called out for governmental purposes. The Greeks were using the word ecclesia. They were using the word church to describe a group of people who were called out to sit at the feet. In the Roman times, it was to sit at the feet of Caesar and to hear his heart. And to hear what laws he wanted to pass. And what he wanted done throughout the kingdom. And this group which was called the Ecclesia, That was close to the king's heart. When they heard what the king desired. They went out through the kingdom. And make sure what he was desiring. Was taking place in all the realms that he ruled over. Ooh. That brings a new revelation to church. I'm coming to church. Wait a minute. So you're coming to a governmental, influential place that functions from the heavens, that goes into the heavens and finds the heart of the Father and then implements that on the earth through the kingdom to be Ah, see? Talk about the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Well, this is not the church. These four walls are not the church. Matter of fact, you might not be the church. Because the church, the ecclesia, oh, that hurt your feelings. The ecclesia, I want to teach you because we all have an invitation to be part of the ecclesia. The ecclesia is the group of people that's goal and purpose is to sit at the master's feet, hear what he's saying, and then implement what his desires are on this earth just like they are in heaven. So somebody says, I'm the church. I am the church. Yes, it's not the four walls. I am that church. So my question then is, when have you been at his feet to find out what he wants and then bring what he wants to the earth and start making sure that what he wants to happen on the earth is taking place? Now, though the Greeks invented this word, ecclesia, it was the Romans who, who developed it. Here's, here's what I thought was so interesting. The Greeks were good about forming ideas and just bracketing them and setting them to the side. But the Romans took what they had bracketed to the side and started implementing it. I believe God is going to raise up a generation of people who will take what has been bracketed and put to the side by other generations and say, nope, we're going to implement that here right now. We want it to be on earth just like it is in heaven. Other people have just had great theories and great ideas, but we want to take and make it applicable and use it right here, right now. Now, let's give you a, more, a little bit more revelation. If we are called to be the church, then what we've got to do is, as a body, start sitting at his feet, finding out what his desires are, talking about what his desires are, and start planning on bringing what he's desiring into the earth in manifestation in our lives. That's how we become the ecclesia. 
and every one of us have an invitation to be a part of the ecclesia. Number three, he says, the gates of hell is not going to prevail against the church. Now, I have a very vivid imagination. And I've always thought about this scripture and saw where it says the gates of hell will not prevail. And in my mind, I see like these flaming gates just floating around trying to push people over and bulldoze them down and, and all this. But then when they come against a believer, then they're not able to do that. But that's ne not necessarily what that means. <laughs> see, because gates are stationary, they're not portable. When a territory was established with defined borders, walls were built around it, then there were gates installed in the wall to keep enemies out or to keep the people in, or both. So when the kingdom of darkness start setting up strongholds, whether they be in your life. This is Holy Spirit right here. Whether they be in your life or whether they be in your city, he wants to start fortifying places and then establishing gates so that this stronghold will remain. So he's saying, Peter, on the revelation that Jesus, I am Christ, I am Lord, I am Son of the living God, I'm going to build my governmental body who will function from heaven to the earth and the gates of hell. When you see an outpost in from the kingdom of darkness, in darkness, in a city or in a person or in a region, those gates are not going to keep you out. You'll be able to bulldoze right through those things and you will be able to liberate strongholds from the enemy. I've heard it preached. The gates are stationary and it, when it feels like you're at your lowest point in your valley, and you're at the gates of hell, and you're about to get overtaken. You won't get overtaken. And, and, and that's not even what he's saying right there. This is, this is, this is offensive. This is not defensive. I'm, I'm sure it'll work both ways, but the primary thing of this is when we are advancing, enemy strongholds will not be able to hold back, will not have any, any way any way to hold back the government of the kingdom of God. Now, in the Old Testament, we see that judgments were made at the gate. I got real excited when I found this passage and, and realized, you know, Samson. How many love Samson? Anybody can... I think we can all relate to Samson in some level. But Samson was a mighty man of God, very anointed man. He had a lot of highs and he had a lot of lows and he had a whole lot of problem with his flesh. I feel we'd all been like, uh-huh, yeah, I can totally agree with, I, I can identify with Samson. But I know all of you in this room are totally identifying with Jesus and, you know, you don't have any problem with your flesh. But, but Samson, maybe somebody listening on Facebook Live right now is understanding this right here. But Samson, man, he had a problem with his flesh. But look, I want you to see the grace and the mercy of God. He had a problem with his flesh. He got caught up, ensnared in a temptation. He goes into this city, spends the night with this harlot in this city, and he is, he is there all night, and the enemy says, shut the gates, lock him inside of the city. And you see, that's what the enemy wants to do. When we give in to temptation, when we fall to sin, the enemy wants to say, aha, I've got you now. Oh, you fell to your addiction again. Oh, I got you now. And he wants to shut the gates of the city to make you feel like you are trapped in the stronghold of his creating. But I want you to look at what happened with Samson. Samson, when he realized he had been ensnared, when he realized that, when he come to the conclusion, uh-oh, I'm so messed up right now. Your Bible says that he began to pray and he started shaking himself and he goes to the gates 
Oh, my, I'm about to preach. He goes to the gate, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He picks up the gate, and he carries the gates, which weighed several thousand pounds, off to the top of the next hill. In other words, my, 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 I'm just so happy with this. When the enemy has ensnared you and you have even given in to the sin and are guilty to the thing, God still has redemptive power on the inside of you so that you don't have to stay in the stronghold of the enemy. But the very moment that you begin to say, God, I messed up, I need your help, you start shaking yourself and you come to the gate, the thing that was a barrier against you that prevented you from moving forward and you start picking that thing up and you carry it off so that somebody else is not in the same trap that you were in. Come on and give God some praise. <sighs> Woo. Man. And I, I only had two cups of coffee but I feel this. I feel like I had a lot more than that. I feel, I, I, I'm telling you, I, hmm, this is to somebody in this room right now. The enemy wanted to try to lock you in to the thing that you were guilty of. And there's no denying that you were guilty. You know you were guilty. But the very moment you confess and say, God, I need your help. Forgive me. If this was available for Samson... In the Old Testament, how much more is available for us because of the blood of Jesus? Mm. Jacob, when he was running from his brother, Jacob is another fine example. I'm so glad that the Bible is full of people that I can relate to. People that messed up. People that were not perfect. If I was writing the Bible, if I was God, man, I would not show y'all any of that stuff. <laughs> I, would, I would have left out the part after the flood. I would have left out the part that, that the first thing that Noah did was build a vineyard and got drunk. I would have left that out. God's not scared of that. I would have left out the part with David and Bathsheba. I would have left that out and said, no, he was an awesome man. But then I realized he puts this stuff in here to let us know that God uses imperfect people. Not because we are so good, but because he's so good. Because he's good. And then I realize why I'm not God, and he is. <laughs> but I'll be the one, first one to tell you. I got things I'm working through myself, just like you. We're all in this together. I'm not up here saying, I'm at me. look at me. Follow me as I follow Jesus. Because I'd always do it right. I'm saying, hey, let's go in this together. We are in this together. We are family. We are in this together. When one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us fall, we don't say, oh, we don't snarl up our nose and say, I knew you was going to fall eventually. No. Those of us who are spiritual, we see somebody who has fallen and we go to them and we restore them. We help them. We don't shun them. We don't turn our backs on them. We help the people who have fallen among us. We don't say, well, when you get holy enough, you can come back to the group. See how ridiculous that is. That's like seeing somebody on the side of the road who is in a car crash and they're bleeding out in the middle of the road and you coming up and saying, when you stop bleeding out, you can come back. He's like, no, while I'm bleeding out, 
I just need somebody who will stop the bleeding out. And I want, and I'm, I believe that God's raising up some people who will just say, God, I want to be the one who you send on the side of the road to the guy who's bleeding out to let him know there's still hope, that you still save, that you still deliver, that you still forgive, that you still set free. Aren't you glad for the grace and the mercy of God? Hmm. Jacob, while he was running, and he had a good reason to run because he had lied, he had deceived, and all of his lies and all of his deception were finally catching up to him. Have you ever been at a place where your stuff finally caught up with you? Uh, yeah, I'm talking to your neighbor. I ain't talking to you. You just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> but I know there's some people who know what it feels like to have your stuff catch up with you. Jacob, another fine example. Another guy I would have left out. The only person I would have had in the Bible if I read it was Jesus. <laughs> but I'm so glad he included all these people because he showed us they're just like us. And he was running and he came to this certain place. He found a rock and he anointed the rock and he put his head on the rock. And as he put his head on the rock, the reality of the heavens just opened up and he saw a ladder going from the earth to the heavens. He saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder. He didn't have this vision of an open heaven because his life was in perfect order. But in spite of the mess... What he did in a tough situation when he couldn't run anymore, he found a rock. We understand according to Psalms, the rock represents Jesus. When he was at a place to where he, he, all his stuff was catching up, he came to the rock and he put his head on the rock. He put his head on Jesus. And as he did, the reality of the heavens opened up to him. And Jacob said, I'm calling this place Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. What does this mean? When we are at places where our stuff is finally catching up with us. And really, before our stuff catches up with us, we really need to go ahead and do this is go to the rock, which is Christ Jesus, and lay our head, begin to rest our minds on the reality that Jesus is good. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is Redeemer. He is Master. He is Lord. And when we begin to lay our head at rest on the revelation of who He is, boom, the gates open up and we can see what we've never been able to see before. Psalm 24, 7 says, you are a gate. You are a gate that God wants to come through on the earth. Revelation 21, 12 says that there's 12 gates to the new Jerusalem. Three on the east, three on the west, three on the north, three on the south. Not going to get into that right now, but I did have to mention it. I've had so many people ask me, do you believe that Northwest Christian Fellowship is a gate and I have to say every time, because, you know, you always have these spiritual people who ask you questions. And I'm like, yes, Northwest Christian Fellowship is a gate into our city at the northeast area. And he's like, how do you know that Northwest Christian Fellowship is a gate? Have you saw the portal? Have you saw the? And I'm like, I know Northwest Christian Fellowship is a gate to heaven. I know it is. If you go in our foyer and you look up, you see this thing, and it says, the gate. I'm like, yeah, we're the gate. We got a gate. We got a gate right here. It's like, yeah, but how do you know that? Because Psalms 24 says that we are gates. And every time I'm up there, there's a gate. You are a gate. Every time you're up here, there is a gate so that heaven can come through and invade the earth. And if we go 
to the courthouse, there's a gate down there. And if we go to Walmart, there's a gate down there. And if we go to Kroger, there's a gate over there. And the more of us that come together and start worshiping and start celebrating the Lordship of Jesus, uh, that gate, that portal gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally we just get enraptured in His presence. Whew. Mm. You have eye gates. What are you allowing through your eye gates? You have ear gates. What are you allowing to enter your ears? You have a mouth gate. What are you giving access to? Fourth and final here. Keys, plural, are given to the church. Upon this rock, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, he's the son of the living God, I'll build. Jesus is the one building. The gates will not be able to prevail. Though the enemy tries to entrap you, it won't work. I want to prophesy to somebody right now and say, whatever entrapment that has been laid against you, it's not going to work, and you're actually going to carry off the gates of that entrapment. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the third thing, fourth thing that Jesus said is, they're keys that are given to the ecclesia. Do you understand that your words are keys that unlock death and life? Your words are keys. If you started strategically using your words, understanding my words are keys, what are you unlocking? What are you locking up? What are you locking up and what are you unlocking? Because the keys of your words right now are unlocking some things and locking down some things. What do you want to unlock with your words? What do you want to lock out with your words? I tell you what I want to unlock. I want to unlock the reality of heaven so that it will be on earth in my life just like it is in heaven. I want to lock out everything that is not allowed in heaven. If it's not allowed in heaven, we just declare it's not allowed on the earth in our lives. I just want to unlock everything that is allowed in heaven to unlock that on the earth in my life and to lock out everything that's not allowed. What's not allowed in heaven? Sickness is not allowed where my amens at sickness is not allowed in heaven it's not allowed it's not allowed depression is not allowed in heaven oppression not allowed demon possession not definitely not allowed in heaven there are some things that are definitely not allowed in heaven So when we're praying on earth as it is in heaven, whatever you bind on the earth, notice where your sphere of influence and authority is, whatever you bind on earth. God gave earth to man. The heavens and the heavens belong to him. But he gave earth to man. Whatever you bind on earth, you bind on earth what is already bound in heaven and you loose on earth what is already loose in heaven. And I'm to the point now to where I'm saying if it do not come from heaven, I don't want it in my life. We bind ourselves to God and to his promises and we loose ourselves from the cares of this world. So you can go through life with a crowbar or with keys. And he said, I've given you some keys. Keys give you access. Imagine this. you got a brand new Maserati sitting outside. And somebody says, hey, Patrice. Got you a new Maserati sitting right out there. First thing you're going to say is, thank you, Jesus, and where's my keys? 
<laughs> because you can have the coolest car with the coolest features with all the coolest stuff on it but if you don't have keys you don't have access if somebody says here you go I'm going to give you a new house the first thing that they do the first thing that they do when you buy a house uh, you sign off on the per paperwork is, is they give you a set of keys and say okay now you can have access to go and come as you please anytime you want I want you to think about that just for a minute. When you, get, when you got the keys to your house, you got the right, you got the access to come, to go, and to please as you want. Why? Because you got the keys. Jesus turns around and says, I'm giving you some keys to the kingdom. In other words, you can go in and you can come out and you can go in as often as you please. I don't know about you guys, but I want to stay in that realm as often, as often as I possibly can. Keys give us access. How are you using your keys? What are you locking out? And what are you giving access to in your life? Let's stand. What are you locking out? What are you giving access to? Gates. You are a gate that God wants to come through. To manifest his self, himself, on the earth in your life. Mm -hmm.